This is narrated in a, in a Hassan hadith, in a strong hadith, in the Muslim of Imam Ahmad. I'm going to abridge it, it's a long hadith. Okay? Just to try to help us to feel how great a blessing Islam is. There is this Mubarak blessed person called Salman al-Farisi. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This person was born in Persia. He was born into the Magian, Eurasian religion. And he felt unsure about it. And this is what we believe. Anybody who's not upon the religion of Islam is not going to have deep comfort. This is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are Muslim and we are comfortable to our core with regards to the fact that this is haqq. He said, now Salman al farsi he didn't have that blessing. He has huge blessings that we're going to speak about. He didn't have that blessing. He wasn't born a Muslim. He was born Zoroastrian. He was born Magian. And as he grew a little bit older, he found Christianity. And he found a truer version of Christianity. No trinity, none of that. Believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his tawheed. He followed that. In order to follow that and seek what he believed to be the truth at the time, or his only route to the truth at the time, he left his family. He left his wealth. He was from a wealthy family. He was from a powerful family too. He left all of that. Uh, please uh, ask the children to be quiet there. He left all of that. He left his homeland. He traveled to Sham hmm? from Persia. There he found a rabbi, uh, sorry, a priest. The first one was a bad person. He used to steal people's wealth, collect charity, and keep it for himself. He didn't like him, but he persisted. He died. He found another one. This one was, a, he praised him. Say, Nasan Man al Farsi praised him. He found, he found, he passed away. He went to another one. He passed away. He went to another one. He passed away. He went to another one. Priest from priest to priest to priest to priest. Why? Just trying to seek the truth. And these priests, what would they tell him? They would tell him that the final prophet's time is near. His longing, his anticipation, his excitement for the coming of the final prophet. In Sahih Bukhari, it mentions that he went to over 10 different priests. From one to the other, to the other, to the other. Struggling, striving. He's left his wealth, he's left his home, he's left all of that. He's in hardship, he's in difficulty. Yet he wants the true religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happens? Eventually he ends up with a priest and when he's dying he says to him, who should I go to next? He says, as for now, there is nobody that I know on the face of the earth that is following the true religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, go to Arabia and seek the final prophet. His time is here. He was told to send send us in Mal al Fasi. He's already struggled a great deal. He's already toiled a great deal. He's already been through such hardship. Now it carries on. As the Prophet said, those who are close, uh, uh, the, the prophets uh, in the hadith in Bukhari, the prophets have the greatest calamities, and then those who are closest to them, and those who are closest to them. If somebody is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's going to go through a great deal of hardship. So he's already struggled a great deal. What happens next? He's on the way to the Arabian Peninsula. He trusts in some travelers and he says, Can I travel with you? Say, Yes, travel with us. As they enter the peninsula, they, um, they, uh, uh, he is afflicted by treachery. They are treacherous to him. They tie him up and they sell him as a slave. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Still going through difficulties. For what? For Islam. Difficulty after difficulty for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happens next? He's sold into slavery. He works hard. He struggles. And he's in Khaybar. Khaybar is north of Medina Sharif. And because, as I said, he'd been going from priest to priest to priest. He'd been studying. And one of the things that he'd been studying in particular is the final prophet and details regarding the final prophet, details regarding his signs, details regarding his 
uh, place of migration, all of these various things he was studying regarding the final prophet. So he's in Khaybar. Khaybar has a lot of date palms. And he remembers studying that the final prophet is going to migrate to a place where there are lots of date palms. So this brings him solace. He's in slavery, he's in hardship, but this brings him solace that maybe this is where the final prophet's going to come. Then one day the person who owns him, his master, sells him to a, a relative of his and he leaves Haybar and he's now in Medina Sharif. Now he is even more excited because now not only does he see date palms in Medina Sharif, he sees lava tracks. Which is also part of the sign of the final Prophet ﷺ. He will migrate to a place where there are date palms, there are lava tracks. What happens? He stays there for a little while. He's toiling, he's in difficulty, working hard every day. He's been sold into slavery. One day, he hears, the, his owner was a Jewish person, he hears his owner and one of his friends or relatives saying, and there's this person who's appeared in Quba and they're all following him and they're saying he's a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyidina Salman could not contain himself. He was a slave, he's not allowed to speak. He should carry on with his work. That's the rules that they put upon him. Sayyidina Salman al-Farisi can't contain himself. He jumps down from the, uh, the date palm he was working on and starts to speak and ask questions. Where is he? How is he? What does he look like? Start speaking. His master rebukes him. He says, who are you? What's it got to do with you? Get on with your work. He's gone, going through all of this hardship to find al-haq, the truth. What happens that evening? He is blessed. The greatest of blessings. He goes to meet the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <clears throat> In gatherings like this, we often speak about the love of the Prophet وسلم, and so we should. As we speak about the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so we should. But sometimes we need a moment just to reflect upon what that actually means. Loving the Prophet وسلم, is not a slogan to be said. Loving the Prophet وسلم, is a reality to be experienced. And these are amongst the most powerful moments to experience them. Just pause for a moment. Sayyidina Salman al farisi is going now to meet the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What would you give for that? What would we give for that? We're not worthy. But subhanallah, one moment in the company of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This feeling that you experience now, we all experience now. This is what we mean by loving the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if this feeling now is not powerful and not strong, we need to work hard it should shake the heart when we think about meeting the messenger we have so much mashallah in islam but the sahaba are still greater why they had this immense blessing the most beautiful, the most perfect, the most elevated creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They went. They were in the presence. And even then Allah most high blessed them. They learned from the Prophet sallallahu They still wanted more and more and more. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa moved to Medina Sharif. MashaAllah, how blessed are those people. They're thinking, they're overjoyed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has arrived. Hmm? What's their next door? The next door is, Oh Messenger of Allah, you've come to our city. Why don't you live in our part of the city? When the Prophet ﷺ entered Medina Sharif, every tribe was trying to take hold of the camel of the Prophet ﷺ and say, Oh Messenger of Allah, here, here, here. 
They were immensely blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they had some understanding of this blessing, and they realized that this is something we want more and more of. Any person who hears the messenger of Allah sallallahu name or his praise, and it moves him, immediate response is, Alhamdulillah, what a great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the response is, how can I get more of this? Because there's always more. When we are speaking about spirituality, there is no end to it. Spirituality means to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no end to this. We can always be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can always have more love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no doubt we can always have more love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. MashaAllah, you feel beautiful things when you hear the praise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Enjoy that. But follow the sunnah and seek even more still. There's always more. Now, so Sayyidina Salman al-Farsi now, he's going to meet the Mubarak Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He goes, he's blessed, he speaks to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he, he'd, he'd studied some of the signs of the last Prophet. He'd studied that the final Prophet, if you give him charity, he will not accept it for himself. He'll give it to the poor. If you give him a gift, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, he will accept it and he'll eat it himself as well. So he went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said, our Messenger of Allah, this is charity. The Prophet ﷺ took it from him, distributed it amongst the poor, didn't eat it himself. ﷺ. Didn't consume it himself. Sayyidina Salman al Farsi is overjoyed. He sees the first sign of the Prophet. ﷺ. First of three, he wanted to check. On another occasion, he goes to the Prophet, ﷺ, gives some dates to the Messenger of Allah, ﷺ, and he says, Our Messenger of Allah, this is a gift. The Prophet ﷺ consumes some and gives the rest to others. But he consumed. Sayyidina Salman's Pharisee is delighted, overjoyed. One sign left. He was told to look for the seal of prophethood. This is a Mubarak mark on the, uh, between the shoulder blades of the Prophet ﷺ. So to look, at, uh, look for this. On another occasion, he's there. The Prophet ﷺ sat on the ground. He walks around behind the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And he's trying to look. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was most likely wearing what we call a rida. Okay? This is what men wear on ihram. You see the, the wrap around. So it's, you know, it's, it's fairly loose. You could possibly see. So he's there. Trying to look at the Mubarak Khatam al nabuwa The seal of prophethood between the shoulder blades of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the Prophet ﷺ realizes immense and great is the generosity of the Prophet ﷺ. As soon as he realizes, what does the Prophet ﷺ do? Oblige right away. Takes this down, this Mubarak Rida down. Sayyidina Salman al Baksi sees Khatam al Nabuwa. All three of the signs he was told to look for are now present before him. What does he do? He stoops down, kisses the Mubarak Khatam al Nabuwa. And he cannot stop crying. The Prophet ﷺ brings him to the front. Front is the generosity of our Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ is welcoming to everybody. The Prophet ﷺ is warm to everybody. One of the things that may occur to a Muslim, rightly so, when they hear of in places like this and other similar, when they hear about the great maqam of the Prophet ﷺ, one of the things that may occur who am I? Right? Who am I? To even be able to look upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who am I? To be able to be in the company of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To speak to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This may occur to the believer's heart and it's right. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is so great and so elevated and this. This is not just us, this is the Sahaba. They used to feel like this. Say, oh, Messenger of Allah, now when we, whenever we want to see you, we come to you and we see you. But in the Akhirah, you're going to be somewhere, we're going to be somewhere, what are we going to do? This is right when this occurs to the believer's heart. But it must be coupled with something to truly connect with the Prophet wasallam without uh, in any way um, diluting the maqam of the Prophet wasallam in your own hearts. 
what do we do? We remind ourselves that the Prophet ﷺ is so great and so elevated and we have no right to be in the company of the Prophet ﷺ. However, first and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so kind and so generous, he will bless us, even though we don't deserve it. And secondly, the Prophet ﷺ is so humble, is so kind, is so gentle. People who are of little value in the eyes of others the sinner said, man, first he was a slave at the time and society had no rank. Whereas when he came to the Prophet ﷺ, he was honoured. The Prophet ﷺ brought him uh, before him. The Prophet ﷺ spoke to him. The Prophet ﷺ comforted him. The Prophet ﷺ welcomed him. This is what we hope for from our Prophet ﷺ. And we may even dare to say we expect from our Prophet because his humility is so intense, he's made us expect it. Sayyidina Muhammad. Sayyidina Salman al is weeping, weeping, weeping. Eventually, when he stops, he tells his story to the Prophet. If we want to try and reflect upon how great a blessing Islam is, just think about Salman al Farisi, how much he went through in order to get Islam, get to the truth, get to the haqq. He toiled, left his family, left his money, left safety, left security, um, uh, went through hardship after hardship, but look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generous, the kind, how much he gave him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is boundlessly generous. 